let me begin by just asking, how did you start uh, your travels to world sacred sites and how long have you been doing this actually? Well, I would say, first of all, thank you for inviting me. I'm going to enjoy this and I think everybody else that's watching this will also enjoy the conceptual information I impart and looking at the beautiful pictures. To answer your question of how I began this and how long I've been doing this, I think it really started with my parents. My father and mother were travelers. My father was a diplomat. And when I was 12 years old, I was lucky enough to move to India, New Delhi, India, where I stayed for four years. My father was always working. My mother loved to travel and she would take me with her as we traveled around India. And she liked architecture and she liked temples. And so we went to a number of temple sites around India, and I was beginning to get into photography when I was 12 years old. For those people who are watching this who like cameras, I was using a Raleigh cord, not a Raleigh flex, but a Raleigh cord at that time. And I began taking pictures. And then I fell in love with photographing sacred architecture, but I didn't really know what I was doing at that point. And one time I was in Kathmandu, Nepal. And I was at this place called Swayambunath Stupa. And I had this sort of visionary experience where I felt that I wanted to one day create a photographic atlas of sacred sites, pilgrimage temples in India. But again, I didn't really know what I was talking. I didn't know at all what I was talking about at that point. I was just attracted to these places and thought they were really beautiful and thought that one day I might come back to India, which I've now done many, many times, and make a photography book of these type of places in India, in Pakistan and other places in that region. So now it's, I've been doing this really in a sense since I was 12 and I turned 67 in just a few days on April 29th, but I've been doing this in a very assiduous way for the last 38, 39 years. But I really began when I was 12, 13 years old when I lived in New Delhi, India. Amazing. Well, I would say that we could call you the guru of sacred sites. So uh, what are sacred sites? And are there different types of them? Well, it's an interesting uh, word if you study Sanskrit about that word guru. And guru actually means uh, revealer or dispeller of darkness and revealer of light. So it's nice to call me that. I wouldn't call myself that. Though regarding the subject of pilgrimage traditions and sacred sites, I'm I'm quite knowledgeable about that. So what are these? Well, in my writings and on my website, sacredsites.com, I talk about more than 30 different types of sacred sites. And I talk about, gosh, about 20 different factors that contribute to the power of place. There is a difference between sacred sites and power places. And I would like to say that I guess all sacred sites are power places, but not all power places become sacred sites. And initially, human beings, when we were, before we learned how to grow crops and herd animals, we wandered across the face of the earth. We were hunter gatherers and we would follow animal herds. And sometimes our great, great, great ancestors, while they were following these ancestors, these animal herds, they would cross energy lines on the earth or they would come upon places where they felt, not thought about, but felt some quality, character, power at a place. And they would mark those with piles of stone, what we nowadays call cairns. And they would mark these with piles of stone so that if in succeeding years, they were again following animal herds and they saw one of these piles of stone not naturally occurring on a distant hill, they thought, oh, one of our ancestors, or someone from another tribe had marked one of these places. And so they might go over there and feel it or benefit from it, use it in some way. And then at different times, and it really depends upon the area in the world, people learned how to grow crops and herd animals. So then they were presented with the opportunity of where are we going to live? And so many times they chose places that their ancestors had felt were important, places that had been marked by these piles of stone. And so then years, centuries pass, and the 
groups of nomadic families, they grow and they get larger and larger. And then you get something very important called task specialization. Different people do different things. And as the population grows, we have a village turning into a town, turning into a city. And if you study the genesis and the development of a lot of the oldest cities in the world, the largest cities in the world, you will find out that they developed at these power places that their ancestors had discovered. Well, with the development of task specialization, you also get the development of shamanism and proto-religions, and people begin to use these power places for different reasons. And then different types of structures are, are built at them, and these structures have a religious purpose, and it depends upon the religion, what the, how they were used. So then they become sometimes sacred sites, but they had their genesis as power places, many of them. But some of them weren't discovered that way. A really good example is Sufi shrines, both Shia and Sunni, in different parts of the Middle East and the Asian world. And these are places where there might have been a Sufi teacher who lived, and his disciples would come there and receive teachings. And then when the Sufi teacher died, people would come, come to that place because he had been buried there. And so my belief is that when a lot of people go to a place with an intention in their mind, in their heart, it creates a memory out of place. And some people they say this is impossible, but I go, it's not actually impossible because if you take photographic film, little thin piece of earth, it's a piece of earth, it's derived from the earth, and you expose it for a thousandth of a second or a five hundredth of a second, that film remembers what it's seen. Or if you take a piece of magnetic tape and an old tape recorder and you sing into the microphone, that little piece of magnetic tape, which is again a part of the earth, it remembers your voice, it remembers what it heard and play that back later. So if you have a larger piece of earth, one of these sacred sites, one of these places on the ground where millions, tens of millions of people have come and they essentially do two things at these sites. They say please and they say thank you. They're praying to whatever divinity they conceive God as. And so what you have here is for thousands or tens of thousands of years, people coming to a particular place with a certain intention and I feel this, the place, somehow the earth at that place remembers that, and you have this buildup of energy at a site. So a power place can be naturally occurring, or it can be one that was made by so many people coming to it, and then it turns into a sacred site. So though I would say all sacred sites are power places, I couldn't say all power places are sacred sites because there's many power places and you, you know, 72% of the surface is the surface of the earth is covered in water. And then a lot of the surface of the earth that is landed is covered in high mountains. So people wouldn't know where the power places are at those in those regions, but there would be those. Inevitably, what I'm saying is there are these places of power all around the planet and people have utilized them in many cases in a sacred or religious sense. Very good. So. With regards to these power places, I mean, it seems that they predate sacred sites in that they naturally occur. What, why are, are such things there? I mean, what makes them power places? Well, there's some scholars and some dowsers, and dowser, dowsing is a way, maybe use pendulums, maybe use these L rods, you use different tools that actually don't find anything. This is really important to understand. All these different dowsing tools is they magnify a response that our own central nervous system is having to a place or some object. So they just magnify that so then we're able to see it. Some scholars, some dowsers will say, oh, it's the presence of underground water or it's the presence of different minerals. And I think this is true. I actually became a very, very skilled dowser, so dowser over many, many years of doing it. Then there's a place that I live, currently live in called Sedona. And some people say there is a power here. And if you go, if you go on my website, Sedona is shown, maybe some of the people have been to Sedona, it's very red. And some people say that that redness, which is ferrous oxide, which is rust, has some sort of effect here. And there's a power here. There's a character, there's a quality. Um, 
Then some people talk about something called ley lines. And from the beginning, I'd like to clear up this notion. There was a fellow named Alfred Watkins, who was an antiquarian. He wasn't an archaeologist. He wasn't even an historian. And for many years in the early part of the 1900s, he would go to these pre-Reformation pilgrimage shrines or different stone rings or different megalithic sites, and he would mark them on maps where he'd been. And one day he was looking at his maps and he thought, ah, there's straight lines going between them. So he gave it the word, the name ley lines, which he later decided not to call them ley lines because ley lines was a Roman word. Ley was a Roman word, which meant tra uh, trackways for commercial transportation reason. But if you draw some straight lines between some of these sites, they don't follow they don't go any way that you could have a, a person walking because sometimes they go straight up a cliff. You certainly couldn't have a, a cart pulling a horse pulling a cart. So he then started calling them old straight tracks. And he theorized that there was some sort of quality or some sort of energy at these places. The New Age movement in the United States has gotten sort of inaccurate understanding of what Alfred Watkins made. Many people, they don't even know he, who he was. But ley lines are one of the ways that we might talk about power places and the energy that goes between them. But there are other meandering lines of energy that go between them. And a good example of that are what are called song lines in Australia. And song lines were created by the Aborigines, and they would go from one sacred site to another sacred site. And it's a vast country, and they would be singing songs along these lines, and the words in the song would notify them in advance of certain geographical features, such that when they got to that geographical feature, the song that they were singing would indicate a direction that they should then go in to get to the uh, another place that they were walking to. So they weren't straight lines. They were meandering lines. Then you have something called sacred geography, which is really, really interesting. And sacred geography is a sort of clustering of power places or sacred sites in regional geographic areas. And you will find this, a really good example is in Japan, you have these different sacred geographies. Some of our marking power places or sacred sites that only men can go to and others that only women can go to. And some of these appear to have a geometric placement of the sites, though other ones seem to just be marking certain mountains. Um, so there's a number of different types of sacred geographies, some of which are straight lines, and some of which, and this is a really interesting thing, it seems, I'm not saying this is for sure, and I think maybe I know as much about anybody in the world about this, and so I can't really say what it is, but it seems that there might be some almost geometric uh, locating of these power places around the world. And what I mean by this is many, many, many years ago, in the first time I went to Mount Athos, which is the center of Greek Orthodox monasticism in Northern Greece, I had a visionary experience that I saw inside of the earth a number of what are called the platonic solids. And what those means is people have heard the word dodecahedron, icosahedron, tetrahedron. And I saw, I had a visionary experience where I saw all of these platonic solids together and where the vertex points, which is the, 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 the crystal point of the platonic solid, where the vertex points were coterminous with the interior sphere of the earth determined where there might be one of these power places, power places on the earth. And so I thought, well, if you were able to somehow rotate all of those, maybe, and you could situate some of those vertex points on known power places, known sacred sites, it might determine where, or give you some indication of where other places were on the planet. Now, some scholars, some researchers have attempted to do that. And the interesting thing is it does, in fact, we are able, in fact, to have a number of these tetrahedrons, dodecahedrons, fit with the location of certain sacred sites around the planet. To me, this is very mysterious. To me, it's indicative of something that we don't understand at this point, but I think it points in the direction of something we need to do more research about. Fascinating. Can I just ask with one last question about power places? I mean, they seem to, we say power places, they have some power. Is there any 
indication or are there, is this power, can it be negative, positive, benevolent, malevolent, or is, is there such a distinction in, just in the places themselves? I've been to about 1,500 of these power places, these pilgrimage sites in 160 some countries. And my feeling now is that they're all, and I put it in quotation marks, they're all good. They're all benevolent. They're all, it's advantageous for people to go to them. I think it's really important, and this takes me into a discussion of the nature, the characteristic, the gender of the deity that is worshiped at a site. I feel, and if you study acupuncture, you're going to learn that the different acupuncture points have a yin or a yang quality, a feminine or a masculine energy, a negative or a positive, a negative not in the sense of bad, being opposite to positive, but energetically different then. And for a long time, I didn't understand what deities meant at sacred sites. Now I feel, and if you look at Hinduism, which has the richest assortment of deities of any religion in the world, you look at Christianity, for example, there's Jesus, Mary, and then a number of saints, many of which who weren't saints. But if you look at Hinduism, you have this rich collection of deities. And it is my feeling, I contend that, Different deities are a metaphorical representation of the quality or the characteristic of certain places. Or what I'm saying is that these deities are an indication of how the site might affect a human being. And so what we have is a deity. And if you look at Shiva, for example, a lot of people will say, oh, Shiva is the destroyer. Well, that's not necessarily true because sometimes Brahma is creating or destroying the universe or sometimes Vishnu is doing that. And if you look at Shiva or Brahma or Vishnu, they are sacred at, for different reasons at different places. And to me, what that's meaning is there is a characteristic that is told to us by the story. What did Shiva or Vishnu or Brahma or Saraswati or Parvati or these different deities, what did they do at a particular place? So it's not, they're not all Shiva sites, they're Shiva sites. But if you look really closely at the myths and the legends, You'll go, oh, Shiva did different things at each one of these sites. Like there's a place in southern India called Chidambaram. And some people will know about Shiva. And they'll see Shiva in this dancing form with his arms raised. And it's called the Natraj. Well, at Chidambaram in Tamil Nadu, Shiva was supposed to have been said to have danced in a certain way that he only did at Chidambaram. He didn't ever do what he was doing there at any of the other Shiva shrines. So to me, again, if you look at the myths and you know how to read mythology, if you, if you know how to, what mythology really means, you'll be able to see indications in the myth of what I'm saying might, might, I'm not saying this is actually the case, what it might mean. So I'm, I, what I am indicating, there's a possibility that different myths of sacred sites are indicating metaphorically of how the site might affect people. And then you have yin and yang. Okay, well, Women and men are different in many ways. And I think sites on the earth, a site, will a certain site, a yin or a yang site, will affect men and women in different ways. I think it's beneficial for both men and women to go to both type, types of sites, but I think they would have different effects upon men and women. So it, it seems that for us to really appreciate whatever that particular power place or sacred site means and uh, its effect, we do have to know something about its the myths associated with it. And also it's a subjective experience. Would that be correct? Definitely. Is there a lot of times we don't know the myths or a lot of times the myths aren't of sufficient clarity for us to sort of unpack them to understand what they mean. And then sometimes we don't know any myths at all. We just know it was a place that was a pilgrimage site, there's a temple there or the ruins of a temple there. And all we know is it was used for some, evidently some sacred reason, but we don't really know who the deities were. And even if we know who the deities were, it's an assumption on our part to say, well, what it means. I find some people, some archeologists and some spiritual people, they will talk about these places and they'll be saying certain things. And I'm going, you don't really know that. You can't really say, that's your idea. So then this brings us to the notion of subject, the subjective. And my feeling is just go. And I hear other people say, well, this is what you should do at the site. 
And my feeling is you don't have to do that. If you want to meditate, meditate. If you want to just go take a nap, a lot of times at these safe sites, I find a quiet place. Sometimes there's no other people there and I lie down. And sometimes let's say it's a, a much visited medieval pilgrimage cathedral. I find a quiet part of the cathedral and I'll lie down on the ground and I'll take a nap. So what you do with the site, I think you should always be respectful. That's very, very important. But when you're at the site, what are you going to experience? It would be arrogant for me to say, I know what you're going to experience. Who is the person? I don't know who the person is. You're going to have your own experience. But I think it's both. I think it's very important prior to or after you're at a site to take a parallel journey through the history, the anthropology, the sociology, the mythology of the site, so you can get an idea about it. But don't allow that to cloud you. Don't allow that to make you think, well, this is what's going on. While you're at the site, try to put that as much as possible out of your mind and just feel, just meditate, just be there, and you will have your own individual subjective experience. And I've been at some sites and have heard people talk about a, a, a number of different things that they experience. So I think that's important. Uh, it's a subjective experience. So my understanding from what you've said already is that not all sacred sites are necessarily associated with religions uh, or spiritual beliefs, but many of them are. Would, what, what sort of percentage would you say? Is it possible? Well, I think in antiquity, if people found one of these power places, I think that in many, many cases, if it's proto before religion and it's shamanistic, I would think that they would ascribe to these places something that was spiritual or religious. It was something that was numinous, was mysterious. So I think they would consider it in a religious or a spiritual way. But we don't know. We don't know what the people talked about in the sense of divinity. We know how they used many of them, but we don't know what gods or goddesses they had. There's no indication of that whatsoever. So we couldn't say. But it's really interesting if to study them, it brings us into something called archaeoastronomy. And this is a really fascinating subject that if you look at these stone rings, again, not circles, stone rings, you will find that there's something called, a, there's a type of astronomy that was practiced in antiquity that was called horizon astronomy. It wasn't looking long distances through an optical telescope. It was watching the rising and setting of different celestial bodies, the sun, the moon, the stars, and the planet. And people in antiquity, and we don't, again, we don't know how they thought about this. We don't know how they spoke about this. But in antiquity, people felt, it seems, that the positional relationship of different celestial bodies in the earth caused a fluctuation of some sort of energy at these power places. It seems that's the case. So that they would watch over the years using the movement of different celestial bodies rising and falling along the horizon. So when those, those celestial bodies got into a certain position on the horizon, they would know that there was going to be an increase in power and feeling and energy at these sacred sites. And they would probably send people out across the countryside to get, gather other people, notify other people that there was something going to happen at these power places. And so this is the origin, at least in Europe, of the first pilgrimages. So people would come to these sites at particular times of whatever cycle it was, because there was a quality, a character, a power emanating, my feeling, emanating from the site at that time, which was beneficial to people. So they were gathering places for specific times to achieve some beneficial result from gathering there. Now, that's a really interesting question. So some beneficial result. And if you study a lot of these sites, you'll find there's qualities, you know, like in Europe, for example, there is a number of so-called healing sites. Well, what's going on there? I feel that there are certain qualities at some of these sites that contribute to healing people. But if you study it in more detail, you will find that there were certain power places, certain that became sacred sites, let's say pre-religious. So we pre-beaker culture, me megalithic culture. So we don't, again, we don't know what 
the specific legends. We don't know what the people were saying about these. But then the sites were taken over in Christian times and they became Marian or they became Christic. And then they were noticed as having certain types of power and of even being beneficial for healing particular ailments. Really, really interesting. Really interesting. Particular ailments. Some sites were known to be very beneficial for healing diseases of the skin, some for de uh, problems with the eyes, some even for broken bones. So it's not that they're all healing sites. They're healing sites of different qualities. I can't explain why this is, but you see this all over the world that there are different legends about the sites that indicate they have different qualities. So it'd be, it'd be incorrect to say, oh, that's a healing site. Well, a healing site of what? Now, a lot of modern day scientists would say that's impossible, but I remember a quote, um, something to the effect of absence of proof is not proof of absence. Just because we don't understand something, just because we, because we can't measure something, just because we feel things, but we can't measure it in a scientific way doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I feel that there is a power at these places and the power has many qualities. And again, if we look at the myths in some religions, in some cases, we can get an idea of what that specific quality might be. Well, then, if I may ask you personally, have you experienced anything out of the ordinary at some of these sites? Well, again, then I'd have to talk about whose conception of ordinary. <laughs> Who's conception of ordinary? In the beginning of my travels to these sites, when I was just, I'm about 67, as I said. So when I was about 30 and I started going to these places, um, so much of what I experienced was, was non-ordinary. Now I've had so much experience of these, to me, it's ordinary at this point. Um, gosh, it, it leads me to talk about, I, I don't know why this is coming up, but one time I, I did my first set of journeys in Japan, my first journey in Japan on a bicycle. I was there for six, eight months on a bicycle going to all these different sacred mountains and Shinto and Buddhist temples. And then I, and I had a bunch of different experiences, but I remember I came back to, came through Hawaii on the way back and I was on this sacred mountain, uh, Mount Akea, and I was climbing the mountain and then I saw this volcanic sub caldera down on the side of the mountain and something in me said, don't go there. And then I climbed up the top of the mountain and I came down and I went to that caldera and I went down inside of it. And the closer I got to the, the bottom of this caldera, smaller caldera, something inside me was going, don't go there, don't go there. But I went there and I didn't really necessarily feel anything at that point. I felt a little disturbance. But then for two or three weeks after that, I felt quite depressed. And I didn't really connect the two necessarily. And in the succeeding years, I've had that experience a number of times. And a couple of the times were actually a sort of frightening experience I had. And one time I was at a, a, a temple called Labna in Yucatan in Mexico. And I had a really, really frightening experience at that point. And then some time later, I came to understand that it was, I'd have to go into more detail about this, but it was frightening because I, I experienced the void. I had a, a very powerful spiritual experience where I confronted the void and it was at first frightening to me. And then I came to understand by going into the experience deeper and deeper that it wasn't, it was frightening because it was, it was scary because the void, it was dark. It was big. It was endless. And I didn't know how to experience it. I didn't know how to handle it. And then I mustered up the courage inside of myself to go into the void. And then it wasn't bad. It wasn't dark. It was just something that I hadn't understood that I had run away from because I was fearful of it. And now I've had those sort of experience at an, uh, experiences at a number of different power places. And some of them, I would actually say, I wouldn't recommend for people to go to unless they had had a real lot of preparation in doing meditation. They were mature spiritually and they've been to a number of these sites because I think that something might occur to them that they wouldn't understand. And then there would be a tendency to say that they were 
malevolent or they were bad. No, I wouldn't say that they're malevolent or they're bad. I would say that the person who is at the site is not sufficiently prepared for whatever is there. Mm -hmm. So I've had some, in the past, difficult experiences at these places. It doesn't happen to me anymore. Now I pretty much, any place that I go to, I can handle. And I speak about that in the sense of going to all these power places But I've also, one thing, as I travel, I go to all these pilgrimage sites. I also go to art museums and botanical gardens, and I also go to slums and landfills. And I've been, I haven't been to prisons, and I haven't been to war zones, at least while they're happening, but I've been all over Afghanistan and Syria, you know, in Sudan and in Bangladesh. And I go to the most beautiful and positive places, and I go to a lot of negative places also. And what it has done for me is made me stronger, made me stronger, that I can now handle pretty much difficulty and still stay centered and still stay in a, in a place of peace inside of my, myself. Wonderful. You know, I was just um, thinking about, again, the architectural aspects of some of these very well-known sacred sites, like the pyramids, and that are seem to be not limited to Egypt, but various forms and various types of pyramids that are, are located in various continents, actually. So are, are they something special about that particular architecture? Well, I think architecture has the possibility to gather, concentrate, and radiate the energies of a place. There are different types of architecture at different types of power places and sacred sites. One of the things about pyramids is we didn't have steel in antiquity, so we couldn't build buildings that stood straight up. And so with large stones, it just makes sense to build them in a certain way. So structurally, we can explain why pyramids were built. One reason we can explain that. Then if you look at pyramids, there's sort of almost two types of pyramids. There's the Great Pyramid in Egypt, and there's all the other ones. Though you could also say the the Great Pyramid at Teotihuacan in, outside of Mexico City. We don't know what, we can't even call it, say what it was called, Teotihuacan is. We don't know what the people who built it, what they called it. And it's not how it looks now. There was an unscrupulous non-archaeologist non-engineer, not an architecture architect, who re- did some reconstruction of it in early 1900s. And the way he reconstructed or had it reconstructed is not the way it used to look. So we don't really know how it used to look. And the Great Pyramid, a really interesting one in Egypt, I was back there a year ago, a year and a half ago, drove around for a whole month. Um, it's very much different than the other pyramids in Egypt, in the Giza Plateau, very much different. In my feeling, and Graham Hancock and some other people, and there's a lot of evidence, in my opinion, that shows it wasn't built. Like some people mistakenly, in my opinion, call it the Pyramid of Cheops or Khufu. No evidence whatsoever that he constructed this. He put his name on it when he embellished it, but he didn't construct it. My feeling and I write about this extensively on my website. There's a, if you go on the uh, Africa page, then the Egypt page, and you can see a, a something says Great Pyramid. And you can read a seven, eight page essay I wrote on that. My feeling is that the Great Pyramid was probably, probably built in sometime before 10,500 BC. And then the Egyptians, the Egyptian people came together around 3000 BC and they saw this extraordinary structure. And so they attempted to copy it and all the copies they've made are, don't have near the architectural sophistication and are falling apart. But the Great Pyramid itself is completely unusual. My feeling about it is again, it was a structure designed to gather, concentrate and focus some sort of energy at specific places. It is completely misleading and mistaken to call say that there's a king's chamber and a queen's chamber. No such thing. You could say the larger chamber and the smaller chamber. In that larger chamber, there is a coffer. It wasn't a sarcophagus. It was a coffer. And it's a real mystery. We don't know how they got it in there. They had to build the pyramid up to a certain level. 
and then bring that in and then build chain, build more of the pyramid above it. But that coffer used to be in a different position. And when you, on a particular date, when you were to get inside of that coffer and the coffer was in a different position, the position of that coffer would have your head or the head of anybody that was in it in a particular place. And it is my feeling that there's some quality at a certain times, plural, times of the year, that there was a certain energy there. And the structure of the pyramid would somehow, I'm not sure of this, somehow focus that energy to a particular place inside of that coffer. And so when someone was, was in that coffer, they would have a variety of experiences. Um, I've sat in, I've been in a coffer a number of times, and I also pretty much know where that point would have been, which isn't in the coffer at all. You'd have to be inside of that larger chamber and then know what you're doing and understand pyramid architecture and know where to go stand so that your head would be in the position that it would have been if the coffer was still in the correct location. It's been moved. Um, so those are just pyramids. But there's, if you look at, here's a good example. There are a number of what are called, and they call the, the archaeologists in Europe, they call them passage, I mean, they call them burial mounds. There's a big one called Newgrange. Doesn't look how it used to look. The archaeologists reconstructed and it looks a lot different now. And they, they like to call them passage tombs. There's no evidence that they're tombs whatsoever. We find bones in some of them, but the bones, if you date the bones, you will find out the bones are not as old as the structures themselves. So you have the structures were built by somebody, some people, and then later people found these big structures and they buried people in, the, in them, but that doesn't mean they were built for that. And then if some of these structures Newgrange, now South, and a whole bunch of others in, in Scotland, England, and Ireland, they have these passages into them, into the center of them. And if you study these passages, you're going to find out that they're pointed at certain directions on the horizon when, again, there's the rising and the falling of different celestial objects. Sometimes it's the sun, sometimes it's the moon, sometimes it's different stars. And it's my feeling, it's my, I contend that a lot of these structures are pointed at where this particular celestial object is because it's an indication of when is the best time to be inside of that structure. And then again, later people came and they saw this conveniently made structure and they buried people in there. But I think we have to be very careful of assuming that just because there's bones inside of something, it meant that it was only made for burial. I, I, don't, I don't agree that. And so I can go into a whole lot of detail about this subject. And on my website, I boil a lot of this down. I give a lot more information to this. And on my website, there's also extensive bibliographies. And one of the bibliographies is a categorized one. One of the bibliographies has about 2,000 books that I suggest. And another one has books in 35 different categories. So if you're interested in Buddhism or Hinduism or goddess sites or grids or a bunch of things, you can go onto that bibliography and then you could read, you know, see 10, 15, 20 books that I suggest on that particular subject. And there's no paywall on this website, no advertising either. It's completely free. It's had about 200 million visitors. It's completely free. You don't have to pay extra to see any part of it. It's all completely free. It is indeed a, a, a marvelous resource and an inspiration for all of us. While I was listening to you just now about some of these structures and you know, the antiquity of them, somehow or other, the people going way back seem to have a sensitivity um, about, you know, energy and power and the combination of time and, and place that we are still unable to measure today with all our technological advances. It, do you think we just lost that ability or how that those people have it, and maybe we don't? Good question. I think we do. We don't know we do. It hasn't been cultured and it's taught to us. It's a very subtle thing. We spend so much time in front of TVs that in driving around in cars, and we sort of lose our sensitivity, but it can be 
retrained. Yeah, I think. And you notice I, I'm very indefinite about certain things. I hear other people say things, this is categorically true. This is how it is. And I use a lot of indefinite words. I will say, I feel, I seem, I think, maybe, I won't say definitely. Um, so it's my feeling that in antiquity, more people, and, and think about that. People live directly on the land. Right now, I'm looking at my iPad. It's plugged into the wall. I have an electric light pointing at me. There's an electrical grid in this house. And then if you think about someone, yeah, I've been in a lot of places in Africa. There's no electricity. There's no running water. So people are more connected to the earth. And I think if you're connected to the earth for your whole life, and not just nowadays, people, they go to REI and they get their nice fancy backpack and they get a nice fancy sleeping bag and they drive in their car someplace and then they go out on a walk and they have their GPS on their phone and they're still so connected to all of that. People in antiquity and a whole lot of people still nowadays, it's not like that. They don't live in those situations. And I think they're more connected but I think it's something we all have in us. You know, here, this is interesting. I hear people talking about self-development and I go, that's the problem. The self is already completely developed. So we really need self-discovery. And I had a friend named Papaji or Punjaji and he had a book one time called Call Off the Search. And it was his feeling, he's now passed away, big Indian guru. It was his feeling that all the searching we do gets in the way of experiencing what it is. It's just been acculturated out of us. We don't know it, but it's it's there. It's there. Yeah, I really feel it's there. But you, when you're out there, I think it's necessary to put the electronic devices away from you and just be on the earth. Mm. That That's it. Yes, I would think that uh, in order to really derive whatever benefit or even to experience that particular time and place sacred site, I would think that a, almost a prerequisite, regardless of belief or anything else, is the ability to really become quiet, still, and be present in that place at that time and just open up. Would you say that's a good approach? I think that's important. And I like in what you just said, you use the word time twice. And I think taking time is important, not having too much of an agenda, not being in too much of a rush. A lot of times I have friends and they go travel. Somebody the other day was saying they're going to go travel and they want to know if they should make their reservations in advance and make their return trip. And I go, I don't think that's a good idea. Get a one way ticket somewhere and then just, you know, have a plan, act with abandon. Don't be too much of in a rush. Don't think, oh, I'm going to go to this place and this place. And at four, we're going to go to this place. Just be. Go to a place and take your time. Have an intention. Have an intention. But don't be in a hurry. And again, as I was saying in the beginning, what to do with the sacred sites, power places, what to do. And my feeling is just be relaxed. Be actually a little bit lazy. I don't feel it's a good idea to go on organized tour groups. In some cases, yes. And they're nice because you meet other people that are like minded and at dinner, you know, you can talk to them. And my feeling is just go be there on your own and take your time. And then, yeah, and then lie on the earth, be on the earth, touch the earth and don't be in a hurry. Don't be in a hurry. And you don't have to go to 50 places, go to four or five and let your intuition, let your feeling um, pull you to different sites. Read in advance. Yeah, read in advance. I think it's really, really important if you're going to go to a place. And again, on my website, there's so many books that are indicated that are a good idea to read about these sites. Read about them and then go and be gentle and be very, very relaxed. Yeah, take your time. No hurry. Mm -hmm. And that brings up something else because a lot of times people say to me two things. They say, where should I go? And I go, I don't know where you should go. I don't know who you are. And sometimes I say, we'll get my large book, Sacred Earth, and then consult it sort of as an oracle. Have a, an intention, a thought in your mind of where is a place that might be good for me, not everybody else, but for me to go to. Where is a place? And then shut your eyes and thumb through the sides of the side of the book, the pages, and just stop someplace and see where it is. 
And according to the, the power of your intention, maybe, maybe that will be a site that would be good for you to go to for whatever you're going, going through. Or people say, well, where should I go? It's a big world. And I go, well, you can't see all the world. I'm here, here I am 67 and I've been to 160 some countries. And I say to people, maybe the first time you travel, just decide to go on a, on a, a, a world journey that you're gonna go to a number of different continents. You're gonna take three months or six months and then go to a number of different places, number of different continents, number of different countries. And then in doing so, you'll go, oh, I really like India, which I'm very biased. I happen to really love India. Or maybe you're going to go to Eastern Europe, or maybe you're going to go to, to you know, Peru and Chile and Bolivia. As you go around the whole world, then you're going to find some place. Well, then I'd suggest go back to that region and start going to it more often so you become more and more familiar with the region. I think that's really important. Be hesitant of somebody telling you what you should do and where you should go. That's their notion. I don't, I won't tell people that. Um, I, I won't, I won't tell people that. No. Do you think there is a benefit for the sacred sites themselves to be visited by people? Good question. Also, about Gosh, there, there's, a, there's a number of sacred places in the United States, but there are four primary sacred mountains in the Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico area. And I've gone on a pilgrimage to those four sacred mountains a number of times. And one of them called Hesperus, Mount Hesperus, near kind of near Durango, Colorado. And one day I was climbing the mountain. It's 13,325, I think. And as I was climbing up the mountain along this particular ridge, I saw off to the side this, it's very, a lot of small volcanic rocks. And I saw an area where it was very, cause it's all gray. And then it, it, it was kind of orangish. And in the middle of it was, it was very red. And I thought, hmm, what is that? I'll look at that when I come back down. So I went up, went to the top of the mountain and I came down and I went over and I sat in this area. Um, this, the center of it is just really about the size of a, a small garage. And I began to meditate. I was just sitting there. And then I had this, how can I describe it? I had this experience, this visionary experience that I've been doing meditation for nearly 50 years at this point. And I was just doing this Vipassana. I was just watching my breath, not controlling my breath in any way. And then I began to, to notice, and at first I couldn't explain this, but I began to notice that there was a sort of direction of my breath or of my attention. And I spent about 30 minutes here and I came to, it's hard to put this into words, I came to see that if I really, really let go and I was controlling my breath, that my breath consciousness with my breath was going in a certain way and I was taught something that I now call planetary acupuncture and I could go into more detail about it but it, what it was is it, it and I came to understand from this that human beings are analogous to acupuncture needles and if you think the human body and some of the people listening to this may have had acupuncture done on their body and there are these various meridians, and I use the word plural, but there's really only one meridian. And the energy passes, one energy passes through all of these meridians. And these meridians are for the small intestine, the large intestine, the, the lungs, the heart. And by placement of a needle or the thumb and shiatsu, placement of a needle or pressure on one of these acupuncture points, that there is some benefit that is derived. There's some healing quality, some addition or subtraction from an energy to that point and thereby to that organ that is being treated. So analogous to that, and some people might go, well, the earth is like the human being. It's got acupuncture points. And I go, actually, let's talk about it in the other way. The human being is like the earth. It's the arrogance of human beings to like anthropomorphize everything. So here's this earth with some of these points on the earth that we could say are analogous to acupuncture points on the body. And I feel two things occur at these places. There is an energy that emanates at the places that benefits human beings, very much so. 
And then when human beings go to these places, whether they're conscious of what they're doing or not, whether they're meditating or not, whether they know how to direct energy into the earth or not, which I was taught at that sacred mountain of Hesperus, they're still a living system. They're an energetic system. We human beings, we are that. And when we're at one of these planetary acupuncture points, what we're doing is analogous to sticking a needle or a thumb pressure on an acupuncture point on the human body. So I feel it's extremely beneficial for people to go to these planetary acupuncture sites, points, and just be there. If somebody said, well, how does that help? Well, acu acupuncture can't even be entirely explained of how it works. I So I can't explain this, but I think the earth right now is having a difficulty because of us. It's not having a difficulty because of bears and beaters, beavers and butterflies. It's having a difficulty because people, human beings, who interestingly enough, you know what we call ourselves? We call ourselves homo sapiens. And if you understand Latin, that means wise beings. I don't see that much evidence of wisdom. I don't see that evidence of wisdom so much. We are degrading this earth very much. So I think it's very arrogant for us to call ourselves homo sapiens. We're the only species that is killing all of these other species. Where is the wisdom in that? Polluting the earth, killing other people. But I feel that the earth is suffering because of us and we can participate in the regeneration in the healing of the earth by doing many things, by lowering carbon, by lower, you know, doing a lot, a whole lot of things. But we can also go to these power places and just be at these sites. And whether you're a Christian or a Buddhist, it doesn't matter because the earth is neither Christian or Jewish or Buddhist or Islamic. The earth is probably got its arms crossed and looking at these silly human beings because the earth has no religion. The earth has no religion. But if human beings go to these sites, and again, there's two things that happened at pilgrimage sites. It took me a long time to get this. Irrespective of the religion, people are doing two things. Prayer and praise. They're saying please and thank you. Doesn't matter the religion. Please and thank you. So if you go to one of these sites and you sit there quietly and you feel love in your heart, even or even confusion in your mind, you're just at the place. You are an energetic being. You're at the place. And I think it is beneficial for people to be at those places. If you go on one of these pilgrimages, and there's a number of really small outfits, small groups, some of them are my friends that organize pilgrimages to these sites. Then you're with like-minded people at these places, and maybe you have a ceremony with a number of people. I think that's great. But just go to the power places. And again, easy to find where they are. If you go on my website, ah, this took a long time to do, but there's maps on my website that show the exact, there's Google markers, exact location of over 2,000 pilgrimage sites on the planet. So you could say, I want to go to Serbia, or I want to go to Chile, or I want to go to Uzbekistan, go on my website and here's these maps and it will show you the pilgrimage sites. And if you zoom, 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 zoom into, you'll go, oh, that's right where the shrine is. And so you go and you travel to these places, use a lonely planet or a moon guide or a, um, one of these good travel guides and go to the places and then go to the shrine and uh, have your nice experience. Wonderful. So then, Martin, we are coming close to the end of our discussion here. What are your plans in the immediate future? We have been somewhat restricted during the time of the pandemic, all of us. And, and you know, just listening to you and, you know, the opening the world up for exploration and visiting these wonderful places, it really is inspiring. What sort of uh, plan have you got? for the near future for yourself? I love to travel. And you know, if you know more about my life, I, I've traveled in five major phases of my life. I'm very, very comfortable. People sometimes talk about when you come, when you go to, the, you, you know, you go to Tunisia or you go to Tur Tajikistan, you get culture shock. Actually, I get culture shock when I come back to America. I'm most comfortable traveling. I'm most comfortable moving constantly. I would like to continue that. For me, when I was a young boy, I used to pray that I would like to be a glove on the hand of God, a paintbrush in the hand of perfection. And so my life is such that I've been given this wonderful thing to do, which is to also share this information in these photographs with many people. 
I recognize, you know, I've been so many places and I've seen so much sadness. I've seen so much destruction of the earth. And so to me, it's this prayer always, oh, great spirit, how can I assist in my little way? And I think my subject is really, really important nowadays. I think there needs to be this reconnect, people reconnect with the earth. I think that's really, really important. And I'm talking about a spiritual, psychological, emotional reconnection with the earth, but having a real spiritual connection with the earth. And so I, I just say, oh, great spirit, oh, Lord, please let me continue to do this work. Not that many people are going to be able to go to all these places. So please, right here, this place, help me in the construction, the creation of this image so that it becomes a window so that somebody living in Phoenix could be looking at this in there in Egypt just by looking through the window. So that's my prayer. These photographs are windows. And so the people looking at them gaze at them connect with the place just through that. That's my prayer.